This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, everybody, you're very welcome to this afternoon's Executive Office uh, Committee meeting. We are quartered, so we will be able to commence. Um, at this stage, in terms of apologies, I've received an apology from Doug Beattie and also just received notification from George that he's going to be running a little bit late. Um, in terms of uh, Chairman's business, the only thing that we'd like to maybe just pass, although I don't think we've officially been informed of this, but um, I do know from a public announcement that has been made that Doug is going to be leaving us uh, from the committee as Deputy Chair and that he's going to be replaced by John Stewart. Uh, I think that needs to be officially approved by the Assembly next week or, or the week after, and we'll be on an order paper. But I would just like to record my thanks to Doug for the work that he's done as Deputy Chair and to wish him well in the new roles that he takes on. And I'm sure that we'll all uh, look forward to welcoming John whenever he comes on board, either next week or the week after. Uh, I was musing that that's us through two Austrian unionists now, so under a third. So, well, uh, hopefully we'll hold on to this one a, wee, a little longer, and uh, but we'll certainly welcome him whenever uh, John arrives. In terms of item three, uh, the draft minutes from the meeting held on the 19th of May are at page six of the meeting pack. Are members content that the minutes are a true reflection of the proceedings? Yep. <laughs> But he seems to be happy, so this is signed and sorted. Um, in terms of matters arising, item four on the agenda, um, there on page 15 of the meeting pack is a proposed submission uh, from the Committee uh, of Finance to, on the Executive Office Departmental uh, Spending Plans, which we got some information. Are uh, members happy that we forward this submission to the Committee of Finance for uh, or, or suggest amendments before we send that? Okay, I think everybody's happy enough with that, so so they can go then. Uh, that allows us then to move on to item five, which is the UK exit from the European Union, the oral evidence session from the junior ministers. I think we have both Minister uh, Kearney and Minister Lyons are there. If we could move them up into the spotlight and just juggle people around, and we can get started there. Um, Okay, I can see both of the ministers now. You're very welcome. Uh, thank you for coming along today uh, to give us the update. And I can pass over to yourselves if you want to give us that oral briefing, and then we can move to some questions afterwards. Thank you very much indeed. Gramaigat, Colin, am I audible? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, that's great. Well, Gramaigat, I guess where Maha said on the quality, a leg or an. Erlina or Om Tranona. Uh, it's good to see you all again, Colin. Thank you. Uh, so to kick off, uh, Gordon and I will provide a short update for you today on EU exit issues since we last met. At our last appearance before the committee, we advised that the uh, co-chair of the joint committee, David Frost, and his EU counterpart, uh, Maros Chef we're continuing at that point to discuss issues associated with the protocol and that they had agreed to further engagement with our local business groups, civil society and other stakeholders. The committee will be aware that uh, on week uh, commencing the 10th of May, week before last, David Frost spent two days here, uh, during which he met in person with a range of different businesses from across various sectors as well as with community representatives. And we welcome that first official visit here by David Frost, which gave him, I hope, an opportunity to hear directly from our local traders about the challenges which they're facing. Uh, local businesses also welcomed that visit, but they have asked for more in-depth and regular engagement on the challenges that they continue to face. In their ongoing engagement with both Davis Frost and uh, Maris Shefakovic, Business representatives have consistently stressed the need for stability, certainty, simplicity and affordability, a message that we have discussed on many occasions in these committee sessions. And while there remain both technical and political dimensions to the range of issues that need to be addressed, we hope that in their ongoing discussions, the British government and the EU will focus on solutions 
that can address the concerns of our local businesses. The committee may be aware that the British government and the EU are discussing a draft work programme as they seek an agreed way forward. For our part, we continue to engage as necessary in order to ensure that both the British government and the EU both fully understand our unique position and the impacts. And we will continue to reiterate the importance of engaging with our local stakeholders. The committee will have seen recent reports in the media in relation to the supply of medicines. Officials in the Department of Health have been working closely with their counterparts in the Medicines and Healthcare Product Regulatory Agency, that's the MHRA, on that issue. And it is important to ensure clarity of understanding across all interested parties, both on this particular issue and on the wider issue of the approval of new drugs. We're all in agreement that the priority is to ensure equitable access to new drugs for all of our citizens, and we hope that any concerns can be quickly resolved. As an executive, we also continue to review the impacts of the end of the transition period, and we will keep working to identify, assess, and seek to resolve issues that are having an impact on our businesses and community. Our officials are in regular contact with the Trader Support Service on the particular challenges that businesses are facing in relation to customs, as well as on the special customs processes that could be of assistance. Officials are also engaging closely with the Cabinet Office on a range of issues. And before I hand over to uh, Gordon at this stage, uh, Colin, if I, if I may just associate myself with your remarks uh, in relation to Doug Beatty, I have always found Doug to be uh, a consistently very courteous colleague on these calls. His contributions have always been thoughtful. Uh, he's been interrogative, but uh, courteous and pleasant in uh, how he has conducted his business and uh, hosted myself and Gordon. Thank you. Okay, that was a, almost a perfect handover to Gordon, who had dropped off the call and back on again. So hopefully, uh, Gordon, you'll get your. You, are you good to go now? Yeah, if you can hear me. Yeah, I'm perfect. Sure to turn, Thank uh, you. Apologies for that. I was on my laptop and it decided to do an automatic update. Um, so had to get the iPad out there. So apologies, uh, for that. Um, I, I'd like to update the committee today on the formal engagement. Uh, between the UK and the EU, including the meetings uh, of the Joint Consultative Own Working Group. And I'll also provide an update on the EU settlement scheme. Um, the committee may be aware that the government had indicated that they would respond by mid-May to the EU's letter of formal notice on the government's unilateral extensions to the grace periods. Uh, we understand that the government sent a response on the 14th of May, and we are keeping this a legal challenge under review. The committee will also be aware that at the meeting of the Joint Committee, which the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister attended on the 24th of February, uh, the UK and the EU agreed that their team should engage further in technical uh, discussions and come back to the Joint Committee. Uh, as Minister Kearney has advised, these discussions are ongoing and so the next meeting of the Joint Committee has not yet been scheduled. However, the Joint Consultative Working Group uh, has now started meeting monthly, um, as outlined in the protocol, and it held its third meeting on the 12th of May, which again focused on operational issues, in particular the mechanics of exchanging information between the European Union and the UK. The executive was uh, represented by an official from TEO, and processes are in place to ensure that once the EU formally communicates information to the UK, uh, it will be disseminated to relevant departments for information and action as required. It's important that we are also uh, included in the trade and cooperation agreement governance structures at every level and officials continue to engage uh, with UK government regarding uh, executive participation in these structures, which you hope will progress now that ministers have been put in place in Scotland and Wales. Work also continues on common frameworks and legislation, including the development of a system to support the tracking and monitoring of legislation contained in the protocol. And the committee will also wish to note the Cabinet Office published its latest report on common frameworks last week. Now, uh, turning to the European Union Settlement Scheme, the committee will be aware that we're also approaching uh, the deadline for this scheme, which will close to new applications on the 30th of June uh, 2021. 
EU, EEA and Swiss citizens living here make a valuable contribution to both our economy and, of course, our wider society. And to help increase awareness of the scheme and encourage all who are eligible to apply, uh, the Home Office media campaign has been running from the beginning of February. We are supplementing this with our own local campaign, which, as well as raising awareness of the EU settlement scheme, seeks to show the contribution that EU citizens make to life here. The advertising features EU citizens who've made their home here and the messaging encourages friends, family and colleagues to make sure EU citizens know how to apply to the scheme and where to find more information. Uh, we would be grateful for any help uh, that members uh, of the committee could provide in ensuring that this message reaches their constituents. The Executive Office has also been working with the uh, advocacy agency of Advice NI and STEP to support the work that is ongoing in local communities. So officials will continue to engage with the Home Office to encourage an appropriate and flexible approach in terms of those needing to make a late application uh, to ensure that they can continue to live and work here. So Mr Chairman, I hope that this provides uh, a useful and uh, helpful update on EU exit matters. Okay, uh, is that both finished? Yes. Yep, yep, okay, that's grand. Thank you very much indeed for the update there. That is appreciated. Um, obviously, I want to, um, one of the things that I'd like to take an angle on is the uh, the protocol. And I suppose, in essence, we've heard an awful lot of noise about the protocol and its impact. And to be fair, it could be said uh, increasingly that we're only hearing about the negatives. And I noted that last week, the uh, Derry Chamber of Commerce, who had undertaken a study, said that around about 80% of those that were participating in their survey said that they were not experiencing any significant impact as a result of the protocol. And I think we can all agree that that is obviously something that is positive. And I want to try and maintain that positive theme because this also was something that came up in conversations uh, with uh, various committees in the last number of weeks. And I wanted to ask the ministers, and I suppose particularly yourself, Minister Lands, if you can see any positives from the protocol, and if that can mean setting aside the negatives, but actually saying, are there any opportunities for businesses here? Are there any positives that we can discuss about the protocol and its implementation? Well, look, um, Mr. Chairman, I can obviously see the benefits of having access to the EU single market. Um, of course, that puts us in a, in a, in a good position, and, and um, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to be churlish about that, though you're asking me to do something very difficult, uh, which is to say, um, to, to leave aside all the negatives that come with the protocol, because although there may be some positives in terms of the EU access, um, I don't think that that in any way it doesn't even come close um, to outweighing the uh, negatives that we are facing as a result of east-west trade and the difficulties that's be been caused to east-west trade. Um, so, you know, I don't want to be churlish about this. Um, uh, I don't want to always seem to be banging on about the same uh, issue, but it's the fundamental one and it's the one that needs addressed. We do a huge amount of trade east-west, more than we do north-south, more than we do with Europe. And so um, I think um, we need to be focusing on sorting that issue out and making sure um, that we don't have the trade hampered um, in the way that it is currently being hampered. Because remember, Northern Ireland to UK, very integrated, very dependent. All of those things um, are, are massive. And um, I think the fact that it's even acknowledged in the protocol that they want to limit the amount of checks, which they failed in doing, that they want to ensure ease of trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which has failed. It's recognised in the protocol itself, the importance of those things. And yet they've not managed to to achieve that. Um, so fundamentally, those issues need to be fixed. Um, because in my view, in my experience, the correspondence that I'm getting from people, not just in my own constituency, but beyond about the problems that the protocol is, is causing, means that that is still the number one issue that we need to um, be prepared to address. Thank you, Mr. Yep. Thanks, Colin. I think there is a need for a balanced approach to be taken to all of this. Uh, we've heard a lot of talk in uh, recent months about the need to de-dramatise 
uh, language and scenarios. I would go slightly further. I think that we've now got to a point where the protocol itself has become weaponized and weaponized uh, without any foundation at all. And, and that is what is creating uh, the negative political repercussions within our society at this particular time. Of course, uh, when you consider the manner in which the Brexit was brought about, uh, when you consider that that is now five years ago since the, uh, the referendum that took place, uh, and you, you, you rehearse the period or the passage of time since then, uh, when you look at the fact that uh, there was the, uh, the, the option of the backstop brought forward by uh, Theresa May's administration, uh, which arguably was uh, a much improved alternative to uh, the, uh, the current protocol. But Theresa May was made to fall on her sword over uh, the issue of the backstop. Now we've had a further negotiation away from the backstop and into the protocol. And, and that was with a view to trying to get the hardest Brexit possible. Now, the, the European Commission, the European Union, recognise that this is a special and distinct place. It's much too heavily invested in our peace process not to accept that this is an exceptional region. And therefore, I think that's why we saw the solidarity that was shown and the focus and attention that was brought by the European Commission to developing the protocol as a mechanism to try and mitigate the worst effects that would be imposed upon us as a result of a hard Brexit. And we're now five months into trying to uh, work our way through the implementation of uh, the protocol. I'm not surprised that there has been frustration, that there have been blips, there have been difficulties, and that there have been difficulties. I will concede that that has been the case. But this is five months into uh, an international treaty that it has now taken over three years to negotiate in two different iterations. So is it any wonder that we are still in the process of trying to work out how there can be a smooth operation of, of the protocol? Step back from that reality. Step back from the fact that it has been wrongly weaponized for, in my opinion, uh, quite unjustifiable political reasons. Then what we need to see is the bigger strategic picture. And the fact is that this region, the North, now has access to uh, dual market opportunities. That point has been accepted and conceded by INI. They're talking about the prospect of, of 30 uh, foreign investors now looking at the North in the context of the new trading realities. There are 27 other members of the European uh, Union. They pay billions into the European Union. Uh, to have the privilege and the access of being able to have membership and trade within the single European market. The North has now been taken out of the European market, but still has access to the European market. Now, what's not to like? In that context, I think we have to double down, work very hard to ensure that stability and certainty is guaranteed to our local businesses and to our broader community as well, that apprehensions that exist which in some instances have been manufactured apprehensions are assuaged and resolved, that we take the constitutional bitterness that has been injected into this issue out of the issue, and we start to concentrate strategically on how we can ensure that local businesses, in fact, become much more profitable as a result of access to both the, uh, the internal market of the British state and the single European market of the European Union. There is a difficulty that if you keep repeating a false logic, that you actually start to believe it. And I think we have to cast aside the false logics and start to recognize the opportunities, embrace those opportunities. Just last Thursday, I spent a significant amount of time with a local uh, haulier within my own constituency who in, in a completely dispassionate way set out all of the opportunities that are now opening up to that business, uh, which is now looking at increased profit lines, looking at the prospect of greater expansion, opportunities that previously did not exist uh, to continue to trade north, south, east to west, 
and using uh, the uh, using the, the the southern state as a jump off point to maintain the uh, free flow of trade that they have enjoyed uh, on uh, on east west basis west east basis from continental Europe back into the north and onto the island of Ireland. So I think we have to see the bigger picture in all of this. My last point is this: I thought it really notable that Julian Smith, just about two weeks ago, former Secretary of State here in the North, he, uh, he attended the IIEA online seminar along with our colleague Claire Subton in, uh, in Dublin. And both of them, and they have different perspectives on all of these issues, as you might expect. Julian Smith, no, 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 uh, uh, no, not least a former Secretary of State and a member of the Tory party, pointing out that uh, he can see very, very significant strategic business and investment opportunities for the North arising from the protocol once we get it properly vetted in. And, and Claire Sultan broadly agreeing with that. Okay, th th thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that certainly some of what we're hearing is, um, you know, the positives. Uh, I think it's actually incumbent upon the executive as a whole and the executive office specifically to start um, maybe increasing the noise about the positives as a balance to those that are the negatives. I don't think there is anybody, I, I'm yet to encounter anybody that says that the, the, the protocol is perfect. Um, mind you, I meet a significant number of more people that will say that Brexit was unnecessary and we shouldn't have gone there. But the protocol is there as a result of Brexit. And it could be looked upon as being a little bit like an onion. You have to tear away layer by layer with the technicalities, the problems that are there and try and resolve them. But I think that the crucial point is that whenever you get to the middle of that onion, there isn't a constitutional crisis for people in the middle of it. Uh, but that has been injected by some of the commentators and some of those in the party. And I think that what uh, Minister Lyons has said is that there are problems that they need to be fixed. I, I would agree with that. But I think that it is not a solution to simply say scrap the protocol and then try and build around it a, a constitutional crisis, uh, which we have seen the repercussions of on the streets. And I agree with you, Minister Kearney, former Secretary of State Julian Smith did say about there being a huge uptick uh, in, in inquiries from overseas companies. And I know that certainly the seafood sector is saying that it can see significant opportunities because it's able to get much easier uh, from west to east than there is from east to west. And therefore, they're seeing the opportunities. And we know that if multinational companies can come in and locate here, uh, they will get access to dual markets, and that is good. Well, can I ask you as a department... Sorry, Mr Chairman, can I, can I just come in on this? Because I think we're in danger here of um, living in a fantasy world and ignoring the real issues that are out there, and especially the feelings that are out there within the unionist community. This is not a manufactured constitutional crisis. This goes to the heart of what many unionists believe uh, and profess uh, in and their understanding of what the union is. Um, and, and I think we need to accept, first of all, there has been a breach here of the Belfast Agreement, and people refuse to do that. Uh, but the position of Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom has changed. And the consent mechanism, the cross-community consent mechanism, has been blown to bits uh, on this issue. And for it to be implied that this is in some way manufactured or not real is wrong. The feeling out there is one of anger uh, uh, and a sense um, that people have been let down um, by our government uh, and that Northern Ireland is being treated differently. And... Uh, this does not help to maintain the peace, um, as many in the EU and uh, in the Irish government have said. Um, it is threatening it because it threatens, I think, um, the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, I think it threatens uh, our place within the United Kingdom. Um, it does damage um, to the UK internal market. So I can understand people wanting to have different perspectives on Brexit and the protocol and all the rest of it. But let's not underplay the real concerns that are out there and the, damaging, the, the damage that this is doing, not just to the constitutional position of Northern Ireland, but to the economic uh, and, and social fabric of Northern Ireland uh, as well. So always happy to have these uh, debates and these discussions, um, but I think the protocol is fundamentally flawed. I don't think a few tweaks here and there are going to help it, because it goes to the heart of, of significant constitutional 
social and economic uh, issues. Can you hear Colin? Sorry, I can't hear you. I can't, I, no, I can't hear my other Declan. Sorry, yeah, that's my fault. Uh, I was saying that I, I felt there's a, a significantly different tone to your second answer to your first one there, Minister Lands. But given that we have acknowledged across all of our interactions that there are positives out there, can I ask what the department is specifically doing to articulate and amplify those positives and working with businesses to make sure that they are able to interact with the positives to be able to improve be it economic life or otherwise uh, to try and ensure that we're maximizing the benefits that we can get from it? Well, I think first and foremost, um, we can't ignore the problems that are there. And that's where our focus needs to be on addressing the issues that are of most concern to people right now and trying to sort out those problems. And I think that's what people would expect us to do, um, which is to make sure that we deal with these really pressing issues that, uh, that people are, are currently facing. And because it's businesses that are under pressure, um, it's businesses that can't get supplies in or, or um, are burdened with um, so much extra paperwork. Um, compared to what they had before, for bringing in products that are going to remain um, uh, within uh, Northern Ireland and have no danger of going into the EU single market. So um, our focus right now has been trying to uh, limit um, the impacts and the negative impacts and the outworkings of, of the protocol. Dagwin? Yeah, thanks, Colin. Well, well, to come in on that point, uh, there is a division of opinion within the executive office on this issue, and therefore uh, neither Gordon nor I can represent uh, a, a corporate agreed position. I think it, it's fair enough coming into this committee uh, that we acknowledge that, and then we, I think, w with the caveat that we are not speaking on behalf of the executive office, we can then, for example, Gordon is at liberty to uh, to make the points that he had, and I have different points to make. Uh, which which I touch on briefly, but I mean I can tell you that my focus has been on engaging with local businesses, with local stakeholders right across society within my own constituency and further afield through our our our, our major employer and business organisations to ensure that they are equipped with as much information as possible, that uh, the briefings are provided, that they have the details, and that they are in a position. Then I believe as business people who are problem solvers, who are change champions in their own right, they're in a position then to work out in an unsculpted way how, in fact, these opportunities can be shaped. Now, we have to ensure that they are given access uh, to as much information as possible. That's why I have been an advocate and a proponent for uh, an increased engagement uh, by the European Commission with our, uh, our business sector and with civic society here in the north, and of course, of course, also by the uh, by the British government itself. I accept. I mean, it would be uh, remiss not to acknowledge that there is clearly a dismay within some sections of our society. But that dismay exists because uh, those citizens have been let down by their political leaders. I find it quite remarkable that uh, there is now a narrative which is put up in justification for the scrapping or the dumping or the removal of the protocol on the basis that it poses some kind of uh, immediate and present danger to the Good Friday Agreement. This is coming from, from individuals, both in this society and also uh, from, from England, who, who, who weren't talking about the repercussions for the Good Friday Agreement in the lead up to June 2016, when the referendum took place, no one was talking about the uh, the, uh, the clear and present danger and potential ramifications for the Good Friday Agreement uh, leading up to the decision to convene that referendum. It wasn't a feature during the referendum uh, debate. It was raised uh, during the referendum debate in this society by my own party. I know your own party was uh, directly involved in highlighting that as something that could be uh, very badly damaged if, in fact, we ended up with a, a, a hard Brexit. And now we have a hard Brexit. And most of us, all, most of the parties in the executive, most of the MLAs in our assembly, 
Most of the political and civic leaders in our society are now focused on ensuring that this protocol is made to work in a way where business gets uh, certainty, has stability, where we concentrate in a very objective way in removing difficulties and problems that have arisen, and that absolutely we maintain the integrity of the Good Friday Agreement in all of its parts. And that extends to both north-south and to east-west. So for those now who have become newfound champions for the Good Friday Agreement, defenders, if you will, of the Good Friday Agreement, then that cuts in different ways. And therefore, we have to be absolutely focused on ensuring that we protect the strand one, that we protect strand two, that is north-south, and we protect strand three. There'll be a meeting next week of the British Irish Council. Uh, all ministers should be in attendance and participating at that forum, and there will be an opportunity for us to address collectively across all of the relevant administrations some of these issues. The following week, there will be a meeting of the North-South Ministerial Council plenary session. I hope that all ministers in the North will attend that, because uh, not to do so would be a potential prima facie breach of the ministerial code, and there has been enough uh, messing around with attendance at uh, sectoral meetings of the North-South Ministerial Council of late. It's time now for all of us to buckle down, work all parts of the Good Friday Agreement, work all strands of the Good Friday Agreement, and to do that on behalf of the betterment of all within our society. And yes, let's deal with the technical difficulties around the protocol. Let's get those worked out. Let's open up the opportunities. Let's optimize them. And where there are concerns and fears within society that I think have been wrongly whipped up by some who should know better, then let us engage. Those who have a progressive view of how we can move forward in this society uh, within these new trading realities, let us engage, let us outreach, and let us try to assuage some of those concerns and apprehensions. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll conclude just by, by highlighting from those two answers that there, there are positives, but we're focusing on the negatives. And I think sometimes a statement can contain an answer. Uh, and I think if we're wondering why everybody uh, in, in big numbers in certain communities uh, are having a negative view on what's happening, maybe it's because we're constantly focusing on the negative and that maybe if we started to articulate the positives, it would provide a bit of balance, which may allow uh, a more rounded discussion in all communities and then help us all to move into that problem solving uh, mode. I'm going to move on next and ask uh, Martina Anderson to come up into the spotlight and then pass over to Martina for her questions. Martina. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to both ministers for um, <clears throat> for your contributions today. Um, I have to say that Brexit um, has been an unmitigated disaster, and we said that would be the case, you know, and the protocol is the least worst option. And as the only MEP who voted for it, along with an only MEP in the North who voted for it, along with 650 MEPs, I called it at the time an ugly compromise, but it was one that gave us a degree of special status. And Minister Lyons, you'll not mind me hopefully um, just saying to you with regards to some facts and statistics we've been presented with from NISRA, because just for your own information, because I've heard you say it before, the total trade from the north to the south um, you know, from the north to the south to the EU and the rest of the world far exceeds the sale to Britain. And there's a greater number of businesses in the north sell products from the north to the south than goes from the north to Britain. Now, that's not to diminish or take away the concerns that people have um, about getting a harder border in the Irish Sea. We knew there was going to be a harder border somewhere. And uh, as the head of the delegation for Sinn Féin in the European Parliament, we were working very hard to ensure that it didn't, uh, it didn't come to land uh, in, on the island of Ireland. Um, so we are where we are because of Brexit, but we were always going to have a border somewhere. So can I ask you, in terms of Brexit and the implications now for the executive and um, what I would call um, financial asset stripping, of the executive budget. 
<clears throat> it's to get a, a sense from yourselves what is the executive's position on this because we know that we're facing the loss of EU social fund, EESF as it's called, uh, EU regional development fund, the RDS, and yet we've no confirmation at all from the British government who's been telling us they're going to replace this from the shared prosperity fund. We've heard nothing really in terms of other than promises. And then Britain's internal market bill, which emanated again from Brexit, gave Whitehall a new financial assistance powers over the North. And it has established three funds that unfortunately cut across responsibility uh, and the responsibilities of several executive departments. Now, before uh, anyone that may be listening may, may have thought three new funds, as some people had hoped, that they were going to be additional, uh, that, that they too are financially asset stripping the executive's budget by £70 million pounds per year. So is the executive speaking with one voice? Is there one position with regards to the financial asset stripping of the executive budget being caused by Brexit? Can't hear you, Gordon, your mic's on. There we go. I'm happy to go first on that, uh, Martina. And look, in, in regards to your earlier comments, I don't think there's any point in me uh, going over um, this again. Look, we've had this discussion and argument many times before, and I, uh, I doubt that we're going to bring any new any new light to it. Um, so uh, let's move on to EU EU funding uh, or replacement um, of that. Um, as an executive, we continue to consider um, the impact uh, of that and um, the UK government, of course, intend to use the financial powers, uh, uh, financial assistance powers in the um, UK Internal Market Act to deliver those funds. Um, the Shared uh, Prosperity Fund has been promised as a replacement for EU structural funds, um, but of course the detail on that is continually um, limited. Um, but we do know it will be worth approximately £1.5 billion uh, every year across the UK, uh, and that's going to be competitive uh, in nature. And um, we are expecting um, the prospectus and investment framework for the Shared Prosperity Fund to be published before uh, the summer recess with allocations subject to the 2021 uh, spending review and the executive have been promised a role in the governance structure uh, for this fund. However, that uh, role hasn't been, been clarified uh, as of yet. I'm happy to hand over to Declan for any additional comments. On the broader point, uh, thanks Gordon, on the broader point, I would be very concerned about the financial repercussions that are going to flow uh, in these circumstances. Uh, as we move out of COVID, uh, into economic recovery uh, with all of the pressures that that will create on public services, on the public purse. My great fear is that we're looking at the potential for a new year of austerity on the, on the horizon. Uh, and we are not going to be able to rely upon the funding that we previously were uh, as a, some kind of a cushion against some of the, uh, the greater excesses of cutbacks that the society has had inflicted on it uh, at every level in terms of public services, community regeneration and the maintenance of uh, grassroots community infrastructure to say nothing of maintaining a lifeline to our, our cash strapped farming community. Uh, so the financial assistance powers uh, within the Internal Market Act, I think is, uh, is, is an elephant in the room that really needs to be exposed uh, because we are looking at reduced funding uh, in net terms. Uh, the detail on the shared prosperity fund that you referenced, Martina, is still very limited. Uh, that was promised as a replacement for EU structural funds. And the pilot for that shared prosperity fund, which is the community renewal fund, um, was announced at the spring budget in terms of £220 million globally in total. But only £11 million has been allocated and ring-fenced for the North. And, and yet that's targeted at what previously would have benefited under ESF and European Regional Development 
fund support from uh, from uh, from Europe, and that's far less than what we would have expected or should reasonably have been expected to uh, to receive. So it's not going to be new money, and and it's definitely not going to leave the executive and all departments in the executive in a position where we can rely upon uh, something that will compensate for what has been withdrawn. The levelling up fund that has been much vaunted by uh, the Johnson government is not a replacement fund for uh, for, e for EU funding. And I think it's notable that the only executive access uh, to that particular uh, fund, and there are, there are, there's access to three, transport, regeneration, and town centre investment and cultural investment. The only one that we're being uh, indicated access to is transport. Uh, and while we've been included as one of the bodies that can apply to that fund, uh, we've been excluded from applying to all of the others. So I think that the, the prospects are, are very worrying. Uh, they're arguably bleak. Uh, and I think it will leave us in a situation where in net funding terms, this executive and our society will be able will not be able to rely upon the uh, the quantum that we previously enjoyed uh, in other years whilst we remain within the European Union. And I think that should be a cause of concern right across society. <laughs> It is. It's probably alarming to say the least, given that we are net. We were um, as a region, we were a net beneficiary of EU funding. And when you just listening to all that you've outlined there, there'll be a number of groups and organisations who are in receipt of EU funding and families and households that Brexit is going to go in and rob their wallets. Uh, and their purses as a consequence of this unmitigated disaster. So it really is worrying to hear that amount of funding being withdrawn from the executive. Could I ask, the last time you were here, I think it was five weeks ago, ministers, and you, uh, we were told at that time that the DUP was blocking the passage of the common frameworks. Now, Gordon, you had committed to go off to give us an update on that. And uh, there's 21 common frameworks uh, that was to be approved by the executive. And um, from our understanding from the, the last meeting that uh, it was the DUP needed to sign off on those. So could we get an update? Because we didn't receive it in the pack that came through uh, from, from your officials as to where those common frameworks are at. Yeah. Um, so my understanding, Martina, is that progress has been made uh, on those. And we did hope to have that with you for the written briefing today. That's why it's been held up. And we apologize uh, for that. Uh, my understanding is there's um, a few issues within um, the Department for Agriculture, Environment, Rural Affairs um, that we need um, further clarity on. And that there has been a bit of back and forth between the department uh, on that. So um, I do hope that that is going to be um, that update will be with you. Uh, soon, as you can understand, these are extremely technical. Um, these have the potential to have huge implications uh, for Northern Ireland if there's divergence with the rest of, of the UK. Um, so those are being uh, looked at. It's not the case that the DUP are blocking them. Um, but certainly, um, I will um, be more than happy to share that information with you. Um, well, well, I think as a committee, we need to get that chair because some of these um, are legislative. They need to uh, be put on the legislative time slot. And we know there's um, there's regulatory alignment across the island and with the EU required as well. So this was all supposed to be last year. And we were supposed to be in the process now of taking them forward. So, Gordon, we really would appreciate getting that update ASAP. Yeah, and I think the committee should have its proper role and, and been able to scrutinise these as well, which is why I don't think that the process is ideal, uh, that FM and DFM are meant to give provisional assent to them and then they go to the committee only to come back again. Um, I think it would have been preferable if the committee could have had them um, in the first place, but that's just the way the, the procedure is going. But um, no more than happy to keep the committee updated on that one, um, Martina. Okay, okay. Gary, we could try and pursue that. Perfect. Thank you very much indeed. Um, ministers, we have another four speakers coming up here. And um, generally, if they're quick fire, there might be a couple of questions. If they're slightly longer, one or two. But if we could keep the, the replies as concise as possible to allow many questions to come in, that would be really appreciated. And up next, then, we have Trevor Lunn. If I could ask Trevor um, to come in and ask his questions. Yes, uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks to the two ministers for their report. Can I just go back to the original Reports at the start of the meeting that they gave us, 
and, and not to prolong the agony, but uh, you, you thought they were talking about two different topics, really. The um, Declan gave us a fairly upbeat uh, report. He started off with a report from the Londonary Chamber of Commerce, for instance, that uh, their business up there seems to be quite optimistic about the future. But And everything he said was, it was really about, you know, business concerns and business attitudes. But uh, Gordon uh, almost inevitably came to the, the constitutional and the political aspect of it. Now, I, I wouldn't want to downplay the, the concerns within the unionist community. I mean, they're, they're there, they're obvious, they're given. But I would like to hear from Gordon, perhaps, if, if, if he could possibly forget about that aspect of it, I know it's difficult, uh, and give us his assessment of where we are in terms of the protocol and the solution to the various business problems that seem to exist. I mean, what, what does he think that are the, the biggest remaining problems in the business, economic, commercial sense? Yeah. OK, um, no, I'm happy to do that, uh, Trevor. And I did make mention of the economic issues that were there. Um, and yes, the fact that there was, there, was, there was economic, constitutional and social issues. The reason why I talked about the constitutional issues <clears throat> is because um, uh, that, the, the, the question was put as a, um, that it, this was being manufactured in some way or as if it wasn't real. But I can tell you that the economic consequences of this are just as real and are just as pressing. And um, certainly there's a, a number of issues that are coming up. I think the most pressing issue is the end of the grace periods. And the issue for supermarkets and for um, food products uh, coming in, that's still a concern. Um, uh, that needs to be dealt with. And I'm, I'm glad that Lord Frost has said um, that there will need to be progress or else further action uh, will need to be taken. Um, certainly, I can tell you from my time in DERA uh, that problems continue uh, to um, exist uh, there. Um, in terms of the uh, movement of animals in particular and um, issues that would have um, taken place quite easily uh, are now more more difficult. Um, there's goods that are still not coming in. Uh, there are people that have um, given up uh, supplying into Northern Ireland um, simply because of the additional paperwork um, or um, that they haven't taken advantage of, of, um, of the help that is available from the Trader Support Service or having, um, having looked at it have just decided that's too much um, uh, bother for us. Um, certainly, I would encourage you to get in contact with both the Department for the Economy and uh, the Department for Agriculture to hear some of the issues that they're getting through. I'm certainly getting, as a constituency MLA, I would be surprised if others uh, are, are not. Uh, maybe it's because I represent an area with a port and, and, and more people are coming to, to me about that. Um, but I would say the main issues are our businesses not being prepared uh, to sell from GB into the rest of the UK. Still some issues around um, uh, paperwork uh, in particular and uh, the level of, of paperwork that's that's required. Um, so those are the main issues I'm getting. That's at a very high level, Trevor. Um, but I can certainly tell you that it's not um, uh, in any way all plain sailing and the, the constitutional issues, the only one that we're facing. Um, it's very much um, economic uh, as well. And um, I can give you, um, uh, uh, the, the, there's a file in my office um, of um, the different types of issues that, that, that people are bringing to me, and it is very real. Uh, yeah, Declan, do you want to comment yeah. there? Yeah, thanks, Trevor. Um, I think that the, the, the approach that's been taken increasingly in the last few weeks by the British government to this issue is, uh, is completely counterproductive. It's very regressive. It, it creates uh, precisely the wrong acoustics for trying to allay concerns within our wider community about uh, these other issues that have been injected into uh, the equation. Um, and and I, 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 I distance myself from Gordon's point about uh, these matters not having been manufactured. I, I think, to be quite frank with you, uh, we saw a, a turning point in relation to the whole approach towards the protocol when a lucid poll uh, uh, was carried out at the beginning of January and those results were disclosed. And I think that detonated uh, uh, an effect within wider unionism. And then the protocol became the scapegoat for other difficulties within the broader community. Now, uh, 
David Frost is not helping with the approach that he has adopted towards us. His force majeure letter is, is entirely wrong-headed. Uh, I, I think we have to have a meeting of minds. Uh, I spoke in the last meeting about a lack of trust. Uh, that trust needs to be uh, established, re-established. It needs to be bottomed out. And then the European Commission and the British government need to knuckle down to finding the, the pragmatic and the practical solutions that, in my opinion, would have the effect of removing the greater majority of all of the checks that currently apply. And, and this has been well telegraphed. Uh, there are models and there are templates that can be followed. If, in fact, the British government is, is willing to accept that uh, there can be agreement on respecting established standards for food protection, on cytosanitary controls, and other measures that, in any normal situation, you would want to have in place to maintain food safety, public health, and animal welfare. Now, the Swiss have a, the Swiss have a model which deals with that uh, with the European uh, Union. It falls within a broader system uh, known as the, uh, the European Union SPS zone. Other, mem other, other countries which are not members of the European Union, including Switzerland, including, uh, including Norway and Iceland and several others, are participants within the SPS Euro EU zone. And, and, and that ensures that there, uh, there is no irritation, there are no difficulties in relation to trade flows and uh, the, the, the moving of foods and animals from those countries into the EU and back from the EU into those countries. So there are, there are mechanisms that can be found if the political will is there, Trevor, to actually put them in place. But that does require political will and it means that this particular uh, British government, in fact, I would go so far as to say this English government, moves away from taking a very incendiary and, and a very nativist approach. What they've done is they've given primacy to fabricated sovereignty issues as opposed to looking sensibly at how we can embrace new trading realities for the benefit of all of our citizens. <clears throat> People here in the north are the fall guys for all of that misguided thinking that informed the whole approach to, to, to Brexit pre-June 2016. And Chair, um, I, I had two short questions. It's not my fault that the answers were quite long, but at least they were fulsome. Uh, the second one is just as unconnected to that. Is there anything that junior ministers can tell us about the possible gap in peace for peace plus funding at the end of this year because the funded groups are getting extremely nervous about it and there appears to be strong likelihood of a gap in funding if the ministers could give us a, a short answer to that please and also bearing in mind that we do have the seupb coming up directly after this but ministers if let you us have agree, let us agree let us agree colin yes autumn as the uh as, as the date that we've been given indicatively for uh, the, uh, the the, the uh, provision of new funding. That could create gaps, Colin, Trevor. So l let myself and Gordon go back into the department and uh, talk to officials about uh, that particular situation and come back to you, Trevor, with more detailed information as to whether there's a danger of a lag in relation to funding between the last round of funds and uh, the, the new fund. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, could we bring uh, Emma Sheeran up next, please, then, for her questions? Emma, over to yourself. Thanks, the Million Chair, and thanks to Ministers Kearney and, and Lyons for the, the fulsome answers thus far. I know some of this has been touched on in the conversations around the P word. It has replaced the dreaded B word when we're talking about, uh, about this whole process. But I just wanted to know um, sort of an assessment from, from your perspectives of the attitudes towards UK government and UK government behaviour from the European side and particularly the member states, you know, we've, we've heard there about David Frost's commentary and the, the different things that have been happening around North South Ministerial Councils and particular attitudes towards the protocol. And obviously this has all been agreed and took quite a time to agree. So I wonder um, what what your assessment of sort of on the EU side, what the what the reaction is to to this sort of chat around the protocol. 
Oh, look, I can't comment on what other people think um, of the British um, uh, government's approach. Uh, Emma, sorry, I can do many things and I can answer many questions, but um, I can't um, I can't guess what others are thinking. I'm happy to take any questions that are related to the executive office, our own responsibilities. I can share my own impressions on on that particular point, and and Gordon may not have too different a view from me on this. If, if you set aside your, your view on the issues, clearly, Emma, uh, relations are, are not good. My view is that uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the Tory government had moved to a much more progressive position. I thought they pivoted sensibly uh, into proper implementation of the protocol uh, while Michael Gove was taking the lead. He has now handed that particular responsibility over to David Frost. Uh, I don't think these things ever come down to the whim of a personality, uh, but nevertheless, there, there's been a clear change in tone uh, since he assumed that role. And uh, I would be concerned about the, uh, the narrative that is currently getting built up with uh, the, uh, the, the responses to unilateral, the, 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 unilateral, the unilateral actions taken, the response to the threat of legal action by the European Union with the force majeure letter. And the truth of it is that most member states don't in actual fact have any particular interest in the detail of the issues around this protocol. Because as far as they're concerned, there was a deal done with uh, the British government and now it's time to move on. And, and they're not going to go down any rabbit holes in relation to these particular issues. As I said earlier in a, in, in, in a previous answer, uh, there, there are other members of the European Union who uh, invest heavily, substantially in the European Union to have the privilege and the access and benefit of trading within the single European market. And, and then they see uh, the approach being taken by the, the Tory government, supported by, uh, by some unionist politicians, and I, I say some unionist politicians, uh, who have taken completely the wrong approach to this issue. Uh, they see a lot of dust being kicked up in this part of the world. And uh, those European Union member states are sitting back and saying, what's all that about? Why don't these people recognise that they have something we don't? Dual market access and don't actually have to pick up the cost for having access to both a single market in Europe and also the internal market in Britain. So I think we need a bit of perspective on all of these things. And that's why I think it's really important that the Tories start to get some perspective on resolving this issue, moving on, and that hopefully uh, some of our unionist politi politicians will follow suit. Okay. Happy enough, Emma. Okay, that's grand. Maybe could we get Pat Sheehan up next for his questions, please? Go on ahead, Pat. Thanks, Chair. Um, sorry. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I think uh, Trevor's getting his revenge on me. He asked the question I was going to ask, so uh, I'll I'll forego that for now. Thanks. Oh, that's grand. Thank you, Pat. That's good. Well, then finally, uh, Christopher Stalford, then, please, if Christopher could come up and give us a few questions. On you go, Christopher. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, sir, can I just take um, just back to one of the comments that was made by um, Declan Kearney when he referred to Mrs. May's um, Brexit agreement? I have the opinion of the Attorney General, Geoffrey Cox QC, that was delivered to the then Prime Minister on the 13th of November 2018 in front of me. And in relation to the deal that she was proposing, Mrs May was proposing, he said, Northern Ireland will remain in the EU single market for goods and the EU's customs regime and will be required to apply and comply with the relevant rules and standards. These include over 300 different legal instruments. The implications of Northern Ireland remaining in the EU single markets for goods, while GB is not, is that for regulatory, regulatory purposes, GB is essentially treated as a third country by Northern Ireland for goods passing from GB into Northern Ireland. This means regulatory checks would have to take place between Northern Ireland and GB. I think it's important that people understand this myth that has been peddled, that that which was on offer from uh, Mrs May was in some way a better deal for Northern Ireland. 
is, is just that. It is a myth. So can I ask either of the junior ministers to confirm that that is indeed the legal advice that was given by the Attorney General and that it is absolutely valid and correct to say that even under the terms of Mrs May's agreement, these checks would still be taking place? Well, yeah, of course, happy to, to confirm that that is the case. That was the legal advice that I sought, and I completely um, share your frustrations, um, Christopher, um, when other um, people, um, other politicians, and, and the great and the good in society, and the commentators that say uh, that Theresa May's deal would have been so much better for Northern Ireland, it wouldn't have. Um, arguably, as you've demonstrated, it would have actually been worse. And uh, regardless, it leaves us with the same problem. Uh, which is Northern Ireland being broken off um, from the rest of the UK internal market and our biggest market. So um, that, that's the problem that we continue to face uh, today. Um, whether it had been the protocol or the backstop, the same problems would have remained. And we, as, as, a, as, a, as a party, we obviously argued for something different. We wanted to make sure that the United Kingdom simply left on the same terms as the rest um, Northern Ireland left on the same terms as the rest of the UK. That hasn't happened. But what I want to see happen now is that the UK and the EU at least, at least live up to their own promises uh, that they have made um, about Northern Ireland's position um, and um, ensuring that, that free flow of trade uh, and ensuring uh, that Northern Ireland isn't left uh, behind. And because there's been no evidence at all of a use of best endeavours um, by the EU um, there has been no recognition of our integral place in the UK internal market. Um, the protocol also says that it should impact as little as possible on the everyday lives of communities in Northern Ireland. Uh, that certainly hasn't happened either. And um, they say they have a shared aim of avoiding controls at the ports and airports uh, of Northern Ireland. Uh, and of course, it doesn't help maintain the peace. Uh, it doesn't uphold um, the Belfast Agreement. So I think what's very frustrating, and it's come out here time and time again today, is this complete failure to recognise the fundamental problems that the protocol is, is causing. Um, as Article 16 clearly states, um, uh, if there are serious economic, societal or environmental difficulties that persist or are liable to persist, or if there's a diversion of trade, then that unilateral action can be taken, which is why I think that the government have actually taken appropriate measures because the impact of the end of the grace periods on, on food in particular would have been a disaster uh, for people here. And I would urge people to put aside their own views on Brexit and at least recognise and understand the problems that exist. Because if we're not prepared to diagnose the problems that exist as a result of the protocol, we're never going to be in a position uh, to, to fix them. So it's my real frustration sitting in this meeting today, the complete lack of understanding of what some people are going through and what some people uh, are, are facing, but as an executive office, I think we are united in trying to get the best outcome uh, for our people, and I hope that we can all work together to try and achieve that. Apologies, uh, Mr. Chairman, no, no, for shorter no, answers. Fine. I think, to be fair, it would be a bit late in the day uh, in this meeting to start complaining about people giving lengthy answers or lengthy introductions to their questions, frankly. Um, I just want to take up a point that the, the Chairman has said in terms of increasingly we're only hearing the negatives. I would suggest the reason why increasingly we're only hearing the negatives about the protocol is because increasingly people's lived experience of the protocol is a negative. Um, you mentioned, uh, Gordon, or Declan, if either want to come in on it, you mentioned in terms of consumer choice and limitations of consumer choice as a consequence of the, the rigorous implementation of the protocol, rigorous being that which 50 members of the Assembly demanded. So they demanded this. Um, could you explain to me um, just some of the ways in which consumer choice has been affected by the rigorous implementation of this protocol? Well, again, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go, go first on this and let Declan uh, come in. I think that um, at the end of the grace periods, that's whenever we will see a real impact on, on choice. And in fact, um, I'd recently met with um, representatives of the hospitality sector who were worried about the reopening of the hospitality sector if it took place after the end of the grace periods because they said they would not be able to open their restaurants and operate them um, in a normal way if um, the uh, restrictions that would come in at the end of the grace periods were in place. Um, so that's how difficult it is and that's, that's how hard uh, it, it is going to be. 
there's no doubt there has been an impact on consumer choice because I'm getting it uh, from my constituents, and I'm sure you are too, of the people that are emailing me um, and that are saying that they want um, to bring things in from the rest of Great Britain, but that it's either too expensive for them to do it, huge increase in, in, in the delivery costs, etc., because of the additional charges that people are putting in, or else the suppliers have just said, no, we're not delivering there um, any, anymore. Um, so that is a real and a pressing uh, concern um, for people right now. And as we get to the end of more of these grace periods, um, that's when it kicks in. So that's why we now need to realise that there's an issue and then try to do something about that and make sure um, that this issue uh, is it, it, it is resolved and resolved quickly because it, 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 it will have impacts and it is having impacts now. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll lower the deck. You refer to him, I think, I mean, you refer to him, um, Lord Frost, I think it was an article, I'm not certain if it was the Daily Telegraph or the Daily Mail, um, give you a flavour of my reading habits there, but um, I think... Um, Lord Frost actually in an article identified that he was in Arcadia, a deli in Belfast, and identi identified basically the difficulties that uh, that business was having in terms of importing products. I want to finally just to raise the issue, and I know we have the SEU PBM with us next, but just to raise again uh, the issue that uh, Trevor Lunn raised in terms of Peace Plus not being available to 2023. Um, I know uh, of a, I know that this is some of the figures. There's 240 people employed with young people who are receiving sort of direct funding from Peace Plus. One of those projects that I know involves Alternatives NI and include youth, and it's a cross community and a cross border um, project. Now, um, I understand that a solution was found uh, for ESF projects um, through the, the economy department. I think there was some basically reprofiling took place of money that was intended for COVID responses. So I'm just trying to say that I hope that if that is the position, if I've accurately described the position, and there may be sort of some reprofiling to be done, I hope that the department will consider that because, as I say, 240 youth workers, I suspect, despite what everybody says in terms of... Um, you know, unionist overreaction or anything like that to the protocol. I think having 240 youth workers on the ground in the period of time that is coming is going to be very, very important indeed. So anything that the executive office can do in relation to helping in that matter, I would greatly appreciate it. I'm just flagging it up. I know we've SEU PBM with us later. Well, Christopher, if there's anything you want to send to us directly into our office um, with the specifics of that, um, I'd be happy to make sure that our officials looked at it as well. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just to come in briefly then, Colin, because I know you want to move on, but in, in response to what Christopher has said, absolutely. Uh, I mean, as, as I repeatedly attempt in, in these meetings, even when we have disagreements, it's to try and find where there's some positive common ground. <clears throat> And uh, we do have common ground on those concerns. Uh, what Christopher's describing there is a, a, a danger posed to wider society, all sections of the community. So we, we will commit, we'll jointly commit to trying to get additional information to come back and provide some reassurance on that matter. But you'll not lose the opportunity, of course, with SEUPB, Christopher, to raise these issues. I think that's helpful then in, in reinforcing the point. We need to be consistently seeking to double down on the issues of stability and certainty that uh, are required within our businesses, uh, among employers, for workers and their families, and also then, of course, for civic society within the youth sector, those involved in uh, uh, restorative projects that are doing important work on the ground and ensuring that they're not left high and dry, that can at all be avoided. So we need to avoid a financial drift factor uh, coming into play here. We can only do that if, when we when we accept we are uh, going to disagree on key points, that there are other issues that we can, in fact, cooperate on. Gordon spoke about the issue of diagnosing the problem, and, and I agree with him. You have to diagnose the problem. But listen, guys, when you diagnose the problem, you're not getting away from Brexit in the context of where we find ourselves at. Therefore, th that's just unavoidable. We need to take the constitutional sting out of this issue. It has been wrongly and erroneously injected, and there are pretty political interests that are now being advanced on the back of that. And I think that that's an incorrect approach.
approach to take because that's what they lead to the politics of chaos that are driven by some, by some, and it opens the door to extremists who then try to push the politics of the centre out of the equation. And I think as we move through this period, we need to be very, very clear-eyed and understand that uh, these are dangers that we must avoid. Just to finish on this, Theresa May's deal only kicked in unless and until it was necessary. It was a backstop. And what I would say to Christopher is Johnson's deal was a full stop and it came in regardless. And if I can finish with a, a little quotation as well, uh, just uh, as, as, as a riposte to Christopher's quoting of the, uh, the Attorney General. Let's just finish on this point. The British government's own explainer on the protocol in October 2019 said that it ensures, quote, an open border is maintained on the island of Ireland, a key objective for all sides in this negotiation. It adds, any processes normally required on goods entering the EU will be implemented at the NI rest of the world border or on trade moving east-west between Britain and the north. Finally, for as long as the north participates in the customs arrangements and regulatory zone, there will therefore be processes to ensure that goods entering the north destined for the EU pay the right duty and that all goods comply with the appropriate rules. Now, that's the explainer that was produced by the British government in October 2019. That's and, uh, uh, yes, and just a final point, that confirms uh, what I've said previously, that it's time to see a bit more unionism put back into the Conservative and Unionist Party. <laughs> okay, we'll start. Maybe some finalize each other with final points but yes um look ministers th thank you very much for your attendance here today um i was reflecting there on emma's uh and, uh, and suggestion that if the brexit process was the b word and the protocol is the p word we may hope that the next section isn't called the future or we could be in lots of trouble um but certainly we do need to move forward and we do need to find solutions. And all that I can do is um, impress upon you both that we look for solutions, whatever they are, because solutions will mean stability within our community and stability going forward for people, which is really important. But thank you very much for your attendance here today. And uh, we'll let you get on. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, we'll um, just take a moment or two um, just to... Up back and again, is there anything that anybody wants to add on the back of that intervention or that contribution there, sorry, from the ministers? Um, go, Martina. Just to pick up on what Gordon had said, um, you know, five weeks ago we were told we were going to get an update on the 21 frameworks. Uh, five weeks on, and notwithstanding the difficulties that he outlined, uh, we're still waiting on that update. Uh, these are important frameworks for data realignment. Uh, across the island, and I can understand um, what he had said in relation to agriculture, but we need to be getting briefed on those, and we really need to put some pressure on how these need to be taken forward, because you're losing time in a legislative framework to to resolve these and get them sorted out this, uh, this side of this mandate. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Michael, I'm sure you've captured that there, then to write for that. Um, any other issues mm -hmm. that wants to raise in the back of that? Okay, thank you very much. Members, then we can move on and invite into um, the spotlight uh, Gina McIntyre, the Chief Executive of the Special EU Programmes Body, along with um, Der Declan McArigal, the Programmes Manager, uh, to give us a quick briefing. Thank you very much indeed to both of you uh, for joining us here today. Uh, we'll probably just follow the usual format of passing over to yourselves to give us a quick update, and then we could move into some questions and answers at that stage. So if you're happy enough, Gina, Declan, we'll pass over to yourselves. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll just give you a quick update on the, the results of the consultation, uh, which ended on the 12th of May uh, for Peace Plus programme. You were provided with a briefing, but that was before the consultation ended, so we're just going to give you an update if that's okay. 
We were absolutely delighted with the response we received to the consultation. We had 415 respondents who filled in uh, the survey, so that was a, a fantastic response. Uh, three quarters of those were from organisations and a quarter of them was from individuals. And really the, the most important point to note is the overwhelming support for the programme as it was drafted. And the six themes, if you recall, back in, um, I think it was November, uh, outlined the content of the programme. So there were six themes with 21 investment areas throughout those six themes. But there was significant support for the programme. The strongest, uh, you know, we, we marked it in categories of strongly agree, agree, don't know, and strong, you know, don't agree. And the, the highest uh, scores we received in the strongly agree and agree was 92%, and the lowest being 69%. Um, for the budget allocations, again, the highest scores were in the region of 76% and the lowest 63%. So that shows you the um, overwhelming support for the content as it was presented. And the, uh, the quality screening was also presented as part of that consultation, and there was strong support for that. There was strong support for the administrative proposals that we put forward in relation to um, helping projects and training and that type of thing. And the, we're continuing now with the qualitative analysis of the report. But as you can imagine, a lot of it is very, very positive. So, you know, we're, we're particularly focused on any um, issues coming forward that we can bring in constructively to the programme. But as you can tell, there's actually very little. Uh, there was 40% of the response came from the community and voluntary organisations, and then we had a wide range of response from other agencies such as business organisations, social enterprises, education agencies, environmental agencies, government agencies, research organisations, youth organisations, and um, we 13% who were described as just generally other. But that included arts and cultural organisations, sporting, human rights organisations and accredited bodies. So you can see that there was a wide range of support and the respondents, uh, this is the most interesting part for us, I think, and the most, the most exciting part is that in the main, the respondents were that they, those that wanted to get involved in the programme was 49%. So these were people who hadn't been involved in the programme before, but really wished to get involved in the programme going forward. And so that was that was really, really good for us because, you know, I suppose people expect, oh, it's everybody that knows the programmes will respond, but it wasn't. 50% almost were from new people and 40% uh, of the respondents have previously or currently been involved in the Peace and Interreg programme and another 13% have an interest through stakeholder groups. We had 62 of the responses were based in Northern Ireland, 80% in the border counties, and also 18% in the rest of Ireland. And that speaks, and 2% in other regions, including Scotland, England, and indeed America. And that just speaks to the, the new sort of aspect of the programme of functional areas where we can do a lot more north, south, and east, west. We did a lot because obviously we couldn't go out and do the normal physical events that we would have done, such as the road shows around the area um, and you know meeting people. So we obviously had to do it all through social media, and we used a um, wide range of social media, uh, you know Twitter, Facebook, um, all of you, LinkedIn, all of those as you can expect. We also um, did some print and advertising campaigns. We emailed directly um, with mail shops 2,300 uh, recipients. And we also um, did some partnering work with very relevant interest groups such as NICFA, The Wheel in Ireland, Community Relations Council, Pubble, Northern Ireland Environment Link, Social Enterprises. And we did specific um, events for, for young people. We did um, a video. Uh, we did a, con a dedicated consultation page. We had a, a useful video which outlined the programme, you know, in, in more general terms. And we used social media channels, YouTube channels. We had an infographic, we had an easy read format, and we also went through and prepared what we called navigation papers because, because of the size of the programme and, and the, the range of things that can be supported, we wanted to ensure that all of these sectors understood that there were a lot of investment areas out of the 21 that they could get involved with, and not just the ones that maybe had their title as such, you know, maybe in terms of, for instance, health or environment or community. So um, we prepared those online navigation papers and we understand from feedback that they were a great success. So we had ones on business, community and voluntary environment, youth sector, SMEs, rural community and health. 
and we also obviously did video messaging for and specifically targeted for children and young people. So we did get great response to it. Um, we we had I won't go bore you with all of the the figures on the social media um, impressions and engagements and like li- li- clicks, li- clicks, but uh, they were extensive. So we were very very pleased with the outcome of that. The next steps for us is the um, finalisation of the programme. So we have uh, prepared what we call their indicators, high level indicators that they go in the program in relation to the investment areas. We also um, will finalise the budget because the the really exciting news as well since we last met is that the budget for the program was increased to one billion euro um, with an announcement from the UK government uh, before Christmas that they were going to add additional money. Now the exact amount of the program hasn't actually been finalised but so it's it's one billion euro and maybe a little bit more, you know, just due to the finalisation um, of you know exchange rates and and that um, type of thing. So we will finalise the budget once the the EU, the UK, and the Irish government have finalised and given us the exact figure. The equality screening findings from the consultation again, general consensus, sixty six percent agreement with the quality screening. There we were informed of a couple of reports that we were able to add as an addendum to that equality screening. We've had our expert look at that. So we're very happy with that. And the strategic environmental assessment, over half of the respondents agreed that the findings from the SEA for the Peace Plus programme covered all of the relevant information. Um, I think that's probably all I want to say about the the, uh, consultation. We are in the process of finalising the programme, as I said, with the indicators, the outputs. uh, We've had a lot of input from government departments to help in relation to the uh, targets. And now we just have to uh, get the indicators, the finalised budget, get that approved and then we need the process of approval which goes through the Northern Ireland Executive, the Irish Government and the North South Ministerial Council before we can submit to the EU Commission. Now we can't actually submit to the EU Commission until their regulations are finalised and that's going to happen with a fair wind um, end of June. So we are working to be ready to submit the programme at the start of July. And I would say, because we do have regular contact with the Commission, that we know from them that we will be one of the first programmes who are ready to submit. Uh, In response to some of the queries that came up from uh, Mr Lunn and indeed Mr Salford, uh, in relation to the the gaps that they referred to emerging between current programmes, the the programme is a completely new programme and it will be completely competitive and open for everybody. So it is not a continuation of the current programme. There are certainly themes that are continuing, you know, particularly in the relation to the children and youth uh, sector. There are themes that are continuing because they've been so successful. But whenever the programme opens, it will be a completely open competitive programme. And we will be asking for different uh, results and outputs than what we currently have asked for in these programmes. We have, there has always been a gap, uh, if you want to call it a gap, between programmes of when a project ends and then they can apply to the new one. And that has always occurred apart from 20 years ago between Peace 1 and Peace 2, whenever they, they got the Northern Ireland Executive put in additional money to fund all of, you know, into the programme to make sure that there wouldn't be an extensive gap between um, funding rounds. But the projects that we've had funded in the current suite of programmes, Peace and Interreg, were funded for a specific reason, to deliver on outputs. And they have done a fabulous job, particularly over the last year. We have been very flexible and we have worked with every single project on a case-by-case basis. We have extended their letters of offer. We have uh, worked with them about what outputs they can achieve. We have allowed them to reprofile their budgets to give them extra time. So, for example, the majority of the children and young people projects have all reprofiled and will all be um, working until June of 2022. Um, I think there's only one that finishes in March 22, but all the rest of them have reprofiled their budgets to finish in June. And with that, they will complete all of the outputs that the program, uh, which they were set out to do. Now, the nature of these programs, obviously, is that we don't, we're not providing core funding. This is not, you know, sort of government um, interventions as such. 
We fund projects to do a specific job and to deliver outputs and for a specified period of time. And always with the hope that the projects will either be picked up mainstream or indeed um, they, they'll maybe become commercially viable. But we don't actually, we just can't, we can't, we don't core fund as such, we fund for a purpose. And as I said, the projects have done an amazing job and what they've had to face over the last year. But uh, most of our projects actually are extending out into 2022. Uh, that we should have had quite a lot of projects completing this year, but because we've reprofiled them, they're now completing in 22 and indeed some of them well into 23, which is a little bit of a concern for us because we have to manage them right to the end. Um, and the programme closes at the end of 23. So Mr. Stalford wasn't quite right. Our current programmes close at the end of 23. This Peace Plus programme, as I said, will be submitted to the Commission in July. It can take four to five months for approval, but we're hoping that it won't because we've stayed very close and we've had a very constructive uh, iterative process with the Commission. And we will start to try to get aspects of the programme open as soon as possible with pre-development support and opening calls. But certainly, and we already have given uh, support and funding to the all the local councils to start developing their community developed action plans. Uh, with the with the hope that they will be ready to submit those to us early next year to because they're, they're not in a competitive process they get given an allocation specified for their council area so we are very hopeful that they will be able to get underway early next year and as I said other areas will be open and actually one of the areas that we're looking at first to try to open is the children and young people because as it is it's probably most similar to current work um, that's happening in, in these programs. Um, so, of course, we will be very keen to try and ensure that we retain as many youth officers that are doing the fabulous job that they are doing at the minute. But there is no guarantee because it is a new program and there will be competition for each investment area. I'll stop there. Okay, um, Jana, thank you very much for that. I appreciate that input. Um, thank you for giving us an update on that um, consultation. You've done it's not exactly the easiest time to undertake consultation. So to have done that uh, and get the information that you have, that, that's definitely an achievement. So, so thank you for that. Um, Maybe moving on to, to the subject that you mentioned at the end there, I, I fear from other committee members and indeed myself that we're going to have a problem here because we're being briefed something very different from what you're briefing us and, and that's obviously going to cause a difference in information and I think maybe um, we're going to have to try and work through how we do that. Certainly the briefing papers that I've received is that in some sectors there's up to 200 youth workers that are likely to have to terminate their posts at the end of December and that that new funding stream could take well into to 2022, maybe even into 2023 before you get through that process of you know, getting the, the funding given to you and then you develop the programs and then you get them approved and then you open for calls and then the applications are made and then you go through that process and then grants are given out. And oftentimes, when you get to the very bottom level, for example, at the youth worker level, they may be focusing on something now which delivers an outcome. And if there's a seamless transition to the next program, then they could divert and move in and deliver a different type of work or to different groups. So for the members of staff on the ground, it's a seamless transition. But if there's even a period of three months, five months, six months in between one program and the next, the organization inevitably has to let those people go. And once you let them go, you then have to start recruiting people again. And the people that would have been working for you after a number of months will be off working somewhere else and you have to go right back to the beginning again. So there is a real benefit to trying to keep the two programs back to back and allowing hopefully the outcomes to change, but the personnel and the structures to remain the same. How realistic is it for that type of of scenario, um, albeit that you cannot tell me, well, that group will get that money or get that funding. But if hypothetically a group did apply to the new fund and was successful, what's the opportunity for things to go seamlessly rather than, than maybe with a gap in between? Well, I'm not sure where you're getting your information, Chair, because we, we're not aware certainly of youth workers who are closing projects at the end of December. As I said, we have been working very hard to, to facilitate extensions. And indeed, I know we've granted over 60 extensions. Uh, and we only have 90 projects in the PEACE program as such. So, you know, there are there have been numerous extensions into next year and into 23. 
And so the Young People projects are all extended to June 22. So I'm not sure where those youth people that you're talking about um, at the end of December, I, I, we've no knowledge of those at all. Uh, there is, we are trying to move as fast as we can in relation to the pre, you know, pre-development support. We're looking at how best to do that particular measure, that children and young people, and um, we're considering that with the, uh, we'll do that now with the departments that are involved. It's likely that, but June, you know, there could be a couple of months gap. There, there definitely could be from whenever the call gets opened and and processed through. But you know, we are trying to prioritise it, as I said, because it is an area that it should be seamless. And we understand these youth workers have really done such a good job, and nobody wants to lose them. Um, for, and least of all us, if they can be supported into the next programme. But there is no guarantees. But there could be a couple of months gap. But we, we're looking at all of that ourselves, indeed, over the next couple of days, about timetabling to see how we could get those certain aspects open. And we, and we will talk to the departments about potentially opening or starting to do that work ahead of the programme being approved, which is a little bit, you know, moving at risk. Um, but for them, I suppose, but we will we, we will be doing all of that. So we're very, very aware of the issue, you know, uh, in relation to trying to, to ensure the funding gets out on the ground as soon as possible, especially when you see the support for the programme and the desire for people to apply. So we want to get people thinking about projects right now. Can I just ask about the technicality of the gap, if there is a gap? Who is it that, in, in essence, is creating that gap? Is that you telling us that you can't go any quicker because you are waiting on somebody else giving you something? Or is it a case of just saying, well, if we give a month for this and two months for that, or is it you're not allowed to spend money until a particular time? If there is that gap, what is it that's actually causing that gap? Well, it probably, I mean, yes, as I said, we will submit the programme in July, but we will have to wait for approval. And that's based on the fact that we would have a programme approved in Northern Ireland, Ireland and through the NSMC to actually um, submit in July. And then once it's submitted to the Commission, then we have to wait for them to approve it as well. So there is a bit of time there. But what I'm saying is that we're we're looking at how we could potentially you know, move ahead if the department start getting the paperwork ready, start getting the call material ready and the targets ready to see if we can get ahead of it to avoid a gap, particularly in that area. Um, but there is no guarantees uh, because we, we just we need to we just need to move as fast as we can. But there is no guarantees that there won't be a couple of months of gap. No. Well, look, maybe what I would ask, I'll wait until the end and, and, and share it with the committee, but maybe if we could get our committee clerk staff to actually maybe have a longer conversation with the offline about what those processes are and who you would be waiting on, then what we as a committee can do, we can write to the executive office and write to the commission and write to the Irish government and say, it's absolutely imperative that there, this doesn't sit in the corner of somebody's desk for three weeks before they look at it. It really needs to be looked at on day one, or otherwise we are going to be looking at at, at potential gaps and if we look at our last conversation with the junior ministers I mean there was the suggestion that if we do move into a summer where there are um, significant disruptions that take place if we look at the ones that took place at Easter it was youth workers that got on the ground and actually resolved those problems once the youth workers were given the change in legislation by the executive office in terms of COVID restrictions and were allowed to get out on the ground they solved those problems and it just what we don't want to see is going forward uh, over the next period of time that we end up losing any expertise of individual youth workers because there's a two or three month gap and if you are uh, a young youth worker and you're in a, you know you're living at home and you've got a child and you've got mortgage payments three two three months is a gap that you cannot take to hit you will move on to some other post somewhere uh, and that expertise could be lost but maybe we could we'll get the clerk staff to talk with you offline to find out what that detail is i'm going to pass over now and ask pat sheehan to come up into the um a spotlight and let Pat go with some questions there, please. Thanks, Colin, uh, and thanks, Gina and Declan, uh, for what you've given us so far. Just in, in terms of the extensions you were talking about, Gina, um, is that have all those extensions been to uh, programs funded through Peace Four? 
Yes, those are the ones we're dealing with, piece four and then drag. Right. And uh, you're saying most of those will run until June 2022? Oh, that's the earliest that they'll finish. There's a lot of them are running right into middle of September, um, you know, up to the latest is sort of September 23. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of projects that have to, to run over the next two years. And, and what, what would the criteria be for a group getting an extension? Well, if they haven't, I mean, if they have budget left and they haven't completed on their outputs, they've been reprofiled. So in order to move their budget um, to allow them to, re, to deliver on the outputs and they would have had, we've been working with them. So all of the projects who needed extensions have them. Yeah. You, you see, and I, and I think there's a similar issue here with most of us on the committee that we have been receiving or, or have been given a particular picture of how things are and there seems to be a degree of panic out there particularly among some of the groups that are providing services for young people uh, and you know Colin talked about this issue of seamless transition from piece four to piece plus but you're now saying that you know that's not a commitment that was ever given that they're completely different programs Oh yeah, no, that was never given, um, Mr. Shayton, because that's they are completely different programs. This Peace Plus program is a hybrid of Interreg and Peace, so it's a completely different program from the current Peace program. We had always hoped when we started the consultation, which was uh, over two years ago, that we would actually um, be we would have the program open and up and running um, by the, later this year. Now, or, or even this time. But as it turned out, the, we don't have the budget until Christmas and we have done everything that we possibly can on all of the departments and everybody has worked with us to get the program into the shape it is and the content. But we didn't know the budget until Christmas and in fact, we still don't have the final figure for the budget. Um, so that has to be agreed and that's agreed between, as I say, the UK, the EU and the Irish government. And there, I know they're working hard on it. So um, it's not that anybody's dragging their heels. But also the EU regulations were due to be finalised by December of 2020 and they, they weren't. They're now not going to be finalised until June 21 and we cannot submit the programme until the regulations are finalised. Mm. So there's been other factors. You know, we'd always hoped that the programmes would have dovetailed, if you like, but there was never any guarantee and we cannot guarantee any organisation any role in the Peace Plus programme at this stage because it will be entirely competitive. And especially when you do see as well 50% of the respondents are people who want to get involved in the programme who have never been involved before. So that, you know, it is an open and competitive programme. Yeah. And, and but, but you do accept there may be organisations that have to make uh, workers redundant as a result of the the gap between the ending of this programme and the, the funding coming for the new one? I would hate to see anybody being made redundant. And as I say, especially the people who've got the skills and, the, and in particular the youth workers. But I would have to say that's not, if, if there is redundancies to be made at times, it's not as a result just of the gap between these programmes. It may be that the, the organisations apply to the Peace Plus programme and don't get funded. Um, that's nothing to do with the gap. They're completely different programs. Okay. And, not, and I don't please don't think I'm taking lightly the fact that anybody would be made redundant because we're not. And we want to retain as many people who've been involved and have built the skills up as possible into the current into from the current program into the new program. But you know, there has there's bigger factors outside of our control, as your previous conversation um was talking about. You know, there there are other parties involved here as well and We've, as I said, we had to wait for the budget to be confirmed at Christmas and, and we still don't have the final figure. Uh, and as soon as we have the approvals then for the necessary approvals to submit it to the Commission, we will. OK, just one final question, because I'm sure some of the other committee members will pick up on this. Has there been an, an underspend uh, in the current funding? No, we are 103% committed in the PEACE programme. Now, we will always, as a management technique, 
look to consider that there may be some underspends emerging in different projects who you know may not have been able to do certain activity that they had planned to do um, but most of that underspend at the minute that we would have maybe anticipated happening is being used to extend projects out so it would appear that a lot of them are going to spend in full but we will monitor very closely now to see if there is any underspend um, emerging from projects and uh, then we will have to look first of all to the projects within that are currently funded. Can they deliver the outputs that they are required to deliver in their contract if they maybe need additional costs um, to do that uh, to, in order to deliver an extension? That's, that would be our first port of call. And then before we would look for any particular new projects or to add new targets to the programme, and is there any suggestion that an underspend uh, in the funding may be used to plug an overspend in the capital side of things? There is a, there's a possibility that if there's underspend emerges anywhere in the program, it may be used on some of the projects who maybe the capital ones who might have increased costs due to COVID and they have to deliver their output and they could be partly built and you know they have to deliver. So that would be the first place we would look in order to make sure that the outputs that are agreed in the programme are actually delivered. Because if they're not delivered, then that puts those projects in jeopardy as well. Okay, okay, thanks for that. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. I think the chair is frozen. Are we frozen? I'm still here. <laughs> uh, Trevor, if, if you could, if you could chair and just ask your question until Colin gets back, is that okay? Yeah, yeah certainly. Um, okay, uh, Gina and Declan, uh, thanks again for your report, and I've. I'll go on record again saying what I said the last time you were before us. So I think the work you do is fantastic, and I hope it can continue. But I'm a wee bit confused about the, the these extensions. I mean, the, in simple terms, does does the the grant of an extension to existing program depend on there being an underspend in this year's budget? The the granting currently the granting of an extension in a project is based on they say for example they are going to deliver 200 children uh you know through a program that's their output and mm. they come to us and said well because of covid we've only been able to deliver at 100 so we have this money saved in our budget can yeah. we extend out for use this money now and extend out for another six months um and so that we will deliver the, the entire output of 200. So that's what has been that's what's been happening with all the extension projects. They've used their underspends that they weren't able to do their activity, um, and they have used that to deliver out and so the, to extend their project, the lifetime of their project, to deliver their outputs. Yeah, the the, the organisation that have been in touch with us is one in particular. They reckon that they will they will have a one one percent underspend at the end of this year. Um, so how on earth they, they could be extended for six months or keep their organization going until June 2022 is, uh, seems unlikely. And how many are like that, I don't know, and you probably know better than me. Um, but but it's, it's still, I'm sorry to go on about this gap, but you know that, that's June 2022. The information that seems to be around these organizations at the moment is that even January 2023 may not be feasible. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a chasm, it's not just a gap. And some of them may not survive, may lose all their key people and just, you know, the good work they're doing will have to come to an end and possibly be reconstituted at some future date. But it's, it's actually a very serious situation, a lot of apprehension out there. Mm -hmm. and, and clearly a lot of rumours as well. Uh, oh, yeah. Certainly not our intention that it would be June or January twenty three before projects would start getting funded. That would not <clears throat> go well for the program. And um, if a project, I think there's a little bit of misunderstanding still. If a project has delivered its outputs, we cannot pay it any further money to to just exist because that's core funding. 
Once they've, so that project you refer to, if it has 1% underspend at the end of December and it has delivered its outputs, then that's a fantastic achievement for that project. And yes, I understand the concerns and the uncertainty that the programme isn't open to take uh, applications at that stage uh, or at this stage yet, but that they've delivered their project, it has completed. And that's the difference. This is not core funding. It's, com it's uh, to deliver outputs, it's result and outputs. And once you've done that, that's the project over. Those that yeah. have extended had money, had maybe 10% underspend or 15% underspend, and they've been able to say, can we, do we want, we need to deliver this, we need another three, six months, we've got the money in our budget to do it, we can do that. And, the, and they've been able to do that. Okay, well, I'm, I'm getting a better understanding of how the system works. Thank you for that. <clears throat> it's a, you, you talked about the 1 billion euros, give or take some currency fluctuations, is going to be the budget for this again. Uh, to, to what extent is that dependent on contribution from the UK Treasury or the Northern Ireland office? Oh, oh it's very dependent. It's, a, the, it's the same split as uh, the current programmes are. So, And the UK have put in their contribution um, for the billion pound, uh, or the billion euro program, along with the EU, the Irish government, and obviously there will be match funding coming from the Northern Ireland Executive through the departments and the Irish government departments as well. All right. Okay. Thanks very much for that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that, Trevor, and thank you for whoever got you up into that uh, part of the meeting there as I dropped off. Could I ask for Martina Anderson to come up next then for her question, please? And we'll pass over to Martina. Uh, thank you, Declan. Thank you, Gina. Um, always good to hear from you. And I think, Gina, that it's one of those sayings, sometimes you don't know what you have until it's gone. And I think in the in the middle of all the Brexit madness and discussions and, you know, the protocol, the impact of the protocol, I don't think maybe enough uh, people took account of the fact that this is an amalgamation between two standalone distinct programs at one time, uh, peace and interreg. And now these these two are, are merging into the peace the, the peace plus. So we all know, Gina, you know I'm a fan and, and the EU has had a significant impact on the North and, and the border regions uh, of Ireland. And it's important that uh, that the potential benefits of peace funding, the peace plus funding now is realized for communities. So can I ask you about the um, the local action plans that you talked about? Um, if they're containing uh, broad-based perspectives in the community um, in terms of if you talk about children and young people, we know the importance, all of us, of, uh, of youth services and youth officers who are on the ground and, and, and also those who work with, uh, within the context of those struggling with mental health issues. So how broad-based uh, do you know are the local action plans? Are they scoping up um, as wide as they can, capturing as much as they can uh, for those people who work in the communities? Thanks, Martina. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. I think maybe part of the issue is uh, the fact that this Peace Plus programme is going to be the only programme and we haven't heard people complaining about gaps. I mean, there's always people who worry about it, but in particular the youth sector, I would like to say that maybe they are ESF projects that are concerned, because I'm not aware of any of our youth projects causing, you know, having any problem, given that they're funded to June 22. The in relation to the local action plans, we've um, we've done a couple of things there. We have given the each of the councils have. Um, a sort of an allocation of resource, which will comes out of their own action plan, but we're giving them that um, to use in advance so that they would have staff there to develop the plans. We've also provided some consultancy help from outside, which we've um, hired a, a group of consultants who they will each work with the councils to ensure to help them and advise them to in the delivery of, of the development of the plan. But it's going to be really focused on the community developing the plan. It's about the community needs 
and we have given some ideas, but we're not being prescriptive, but they have the plan has to show how they have gone to every ward and in the council and that it's cross community in the, the areas that they're working in. That we have kept it quite flexible in that we have said uh, that it's to focus on three areas regeneration of the community and that can involve anything from um, capital, small capital projects and it could be training projects, it could be social enterprise or social economy projects, it could be women's projects, it could be anything in there that's going to regenerate the, the, their area. Then the other area is about building positive relationships and the final one is about celebrating um, culture, identity, diversity. So it's very flexible, uh, and, but it all has to be done on the basis of cross-community and or cross-border in certain areas so for certain uh, councils that would work for as well. Um, Declan, do you want to add anything about the, how the, we'll develop the plans with the communities? Yeah, I, I suppose we're, we're very much trying to go down a, a kind of co-design kind, kind of route yeah. and, 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 and I suppose around the kind of community planning models. Um, that a lot of uh, local authorities are already using and are required to use, uh, and the same in the border counties as well. Mm -hmm. So we're very much trying to drive it down to that sort of DEA level uh, or LEA level, mm -hmm. um, or you know potentially you know have clusters of DEAs working together, um, you know in partnership um, to develop these plans and also to have governance at, at that level as well. Um, mm -hmm. So as Gina said, it's very much around those three sort of core kind of. Themes, but it is quite broad as well, mm -hmm. um, you know. But we're 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 working with a, a kind of group of consultants, um, who a consortium of consultants who are going to work across all seventeen local authorities um, to kind of help with that kind of co-design process. Um, also, to kind of look at best practice and models that exist already. Um, so they're conducting some mapping and feasibility at the minute, and they're engaging directly with local authorities really in the next number of weeks um, to start that process. Mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of program of support will continue really over the next um, mm -hmm. period of time, really the next six months, uh, as we work to get the program approved. Um, so picking up, I suppose, in terms of, you know, we're trying as much as possible to offer that support now, um, you know, to assist local authorities, even in advance of that uh, kind of program being approved, because we know this is a kind of core area where there is this ring fence money uh, for local authorities around investment area 1.1. Yeah, and, and it, obviously it will take some time to go out and engage with the community because, as Declan said, we're you know we're very much driving this co-design with the community. It has to address local needs, and we're we're not being prescriptive in terms of it could be clusters of the the local areas so to make sure that they can facilitate the cross community aspect as well, um, and and the peace building aspect of the program. Um, I think a, a piece plus co-design process, without doubt, it, it can make an even greater impact by ensuring that funding reaches those organisations who that continue to to build and and develop the the piece uh, and political process. And you know, you talked about not just within their communities, but also building positive relationships across and. One thing that I have been concerned about in the past and I've raised it with you and I'm fully, absolutely supportive of the need for cross-community. Now, so you have cross-border because that will be important with the interactive as well. Um, but what we don't want is a situation where it's cross-community and it ticks a box. Yeah. And you have situations where, for instance, I come from um, a city where you have 80% of them from one particular tradition. And, um, you know, a project not being funded because in terms of cross community, it then only becomes a tick box exercise to try to draw down funding. And I think, you know, I think some of those lessons of the past have been learned around some of that. But um, see, in terms of all the positive uh, implications that all of the um, work can co-design that you talked about, building a positive community relations, we also know that there are people who have been involved and on the street at times of need and times of tension, addressing situations. I'm talking about in my own constituency, ex-prisoners, um, ex-combatants. You know, working together sometimes when there's tensions and making contributions uh, to to society in that way. So it's work being done to engage with those organisations to make them to make ensure that we don't lose that capacity, that influence uh, that that we have in our society, and as well as all of the other positive streams that you talked about. Uh, we also know we still have a journey to travel. 
No, you're absolutely right, Martina, and, and uh, we picked that up, you know, through the consultation and, and through the likes of discussions with, you know, people like yourself. And in theme one, you'll see that we have a, a, a full area, investment area of 1.2 called Empowering Communities. And that is about looking at those issues. There will be a small projects fund in there with projects up to £100,000 um, to do peace building work. And, and it's to address those things that you're talking about, the, the local people on the ground who just need some support to actually make what they're doing even better than, than what they're already doing themselves voluntarily. Um, there's areas in there, but it built an institutional capacity as well and looking at what we can do. So, And then there's, of course, the regional um, building positive relations. But there is, there's enough in there, I think, for, certainly from discussions we've had and what we heard out of the consultation as well, because there's groups who want to do things outside of the council plans. And they, they've got their own, you know, their own project ideas, but they needed something on a smaller basis. So that is all built in there. But yeah, for those particularly the groups you mentioned as well. I think given what we what you talked about in relation to the gap funding, and I know Pat had raised it and Trevor had raised it and um, Christopher uh, in, the, in the last engagement we had, I think there's a responsibility on us to make sure that organisations are aware um, that the way things are happening at the moment uh, with Brexit, that this is not a rollover, this is not a continuum, this is a, this is a new pro project. And I hazard um, a guess that you probably are right that some of these organisations, it is the ES, ESF funding, it's about the training that they receive because that's more salary based and it's about what they need to do in terms of getting training. And maybe we just need to differentiate uh, those who are coming to us for such funding to make sure that it's peace funding that they are uh, they required and that that's what their concerns are about, or it's European social fund uh, as opposed to as opposed to peace. It doesn't surprise me at all that fifty percent of the responses you got were people who hadn't participated before, because I've always said, given that this is the only pot of funding that we are going to receive from the EU, then there's going to be a bit of a scramble as people don't get funding elsewhere. And it's part of what we said earlier of the unmitigated disaster that Brexit is, but I know you'll not want to comment on that. But thank you very much. I um, appreciate everything that you have done in the past and continue to do. Thank you. Okay, we're going to maybe ask George to pop up into the um, spotlight just to check if there's any questions for themselves. George, is there anything that you would like to, to ask or check out? Chair, first and foremost, uh, my my apologies. Uh, st standard and privileges meeting the dawn to about a half three, so I'm only, only joining you in the last half hour or so. So uh, I have no questions at the moment. So thank you very much. Okay, that's grand. Thank you. Um, maybe look, Jane and Doug, Before we leave it, I think you know we, we've we've been given. The information that we've been given, and there's maybe a suggestion that it's not right or that it might be different funds. So, can I just clarify? Um, the Peace for Youth project maybe would strike me as being funded by Peace for rather than the ASF. So, is the Peace for Youth funded by Peace for? It is, yes. and that and, and those are the ones that are extended out to June 22. June 22, okay. And then uh, the, the, obviously it, it still is a case, maybe I've put it a different way. If the new pro program rolls out and there were appropriate opportunities for them to apply to and they were successful, there should be a fair chance that they will would be close enough to being back to back in terms of a seamless approach. Okay. I know you want to come into that and I understand that, but I suppose... We're sort of throwing a dart at a wall and saying, is it close to it or are we in the wrong wall? Um, I think that we would like to think that we could be close to it. We would we would certainly do everything we can. I mean, there are factors outside our control, but there are factors inside our control as well that we can timetable and start to develop some work and, you know, put resources at it. So there are things that we can do. Um, you know, and that's what we've been doing all along. We've kind of almost ignored the factors outside of our control and just done what we can do. So we will continue to do that, and it might be that that we will be able to to make um, decisions come June to September next year. And I know that's still worrying for people, but you know that's the best we can maybe do. 
Well, look, maybe what I'll do is, I say, I'll speak to the committee as we normally do after a presentation, just to see is there any future actions. But I think maybe one of them might be about where if we can help with any of those things that are outside your control that might be closer to being within our control to see if there's ways that we can help there as well. So, but look, everybody's indicated that wanted to ask questions has done so. Thank you very much indeed for your attendance today. It's always appreciated, and we look forward to interacting with you again in the future. So, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks Chair. And, and if anybody has anything they want to come and talk to us about, please feel free. You know where we are. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, uh, members, we can um, bring people back up again. Um, members, would, would members be happy maybe if we asked Michael just to speak to the guys offline just to check what the things are that would be outside of um, their control, but maybe contacting the government or contacting ministers or whatever that might be within our control that we could certainly try and action that then maybe next week would members be okay with that yep okay yeah. i think that agreement's not okay um okay members then that concludes the uh item six which is that or second oral briefing we can move on then to item seven, which is the Historical Institutional Abuse Committee motion. So it's on pages 141 to 147 of the meeting pack are the relevant papers. It was agreed um, last week. At last week well, I've had it a few times. And I mean, have to say, it's actually scared me to go back to get my name. No one done. Hi, hello, Trevor. Don't blame me. <laughs> I don't know was he, uh, if he was actually trying to speak to ourselves or maybe he was on the phone, but well, look, maybe he'll come back. I have many bits of that, but not, not enough to actually make me even think about it. Trevor, can you hear me okay? Trevor Clark? So, sorry, two times, two times. <laughs> okay, I think maybe we were... <laughs> we were listening into a part of a phone call there wasn't directed at ourselves there. <clears throat> okay, so uh, just to re remind members that it was agreed at last week's meeting that the committee would lay a motion calling for a review of the HIA redress board. There's proposed wording in the pack there. Are members happy enough with the wording that is there? Okay, get an agreement on that. That's good. Thank you very much. We'll get that uh, laid and hopefully. Chair. And Chair. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, I know that we had discussed it um, ourselves as a party. We just maybe suggest that we um, hold off on that for this week and, and take another wee look at it. Yeah. Okay. If 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 you want to take a, another week, yeah, that's fine. Uh, it's probably okay. going to be if we get a committee um, motion there, it will be towards the end of of June. So we have a bit of time there. If you want to take another week at that, that's fine enough. If members are happy. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. No problem. It's, it's, uh, it's just just the, the thinking around because obviously victims groups had raised issues with the the redress and the the timeline. Would a review of that cause further delay? You know, obviously the motion is suggesting that we call on OFMD FM to do a review. Does that not end up that we 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 have a further delay to the process? Okay. Um, I'm happy to take any views. I kind of think if, if, if one would run alongside the other, insofar as if there's a review, until you get to the end of a review, you'll not improve the situation that's there. And if we just leave it, then we're just going to be left in the situation that people aren't happy with. So maybe doing nothing means we'll still be left with the situation that we have. Um, is anybody any suggestions how we could improve the process if we we don't get some sort of review? Martina? Um, um, I, I accept what, what Emma and us we've been we've been concerned about this because obviously none of us on this in this committee want to delay um, any redress or anything else going to the committee. I'm also conscious that in the infrastructure committee we're involved in a planning review, but it doesn't stop the planning process. 
uh, what we're trying to do is to ensure that we perfect it. But maybe in terms of what Emma and we are saying, you know, if we could just check that out, that just to satisfy the committee, that we're not inadvertently doing anything, that the unintended consequences of the the uh, the motion could, for instance, result in, in the concerns that Emma is expressing on our behalf, that that could happen as a consequence of this. So we could just check that out. Yeah, maybe so maybe some further detail of what a review would amount to, or what the you know what what the the timing of that is going to be, or what the expected outcome not expected outcome of review, but the expected process length, the process resource involved. Okay, um, yeah, I suppose we 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 fall into chicken and egg territory, don't we? If we if we don't lay a motion and ask for a review, they're not going to be able to tell us what the review is going to be. But if the review ends up having inadvertent consequences, then we could have created a difficulty. So I suppose maybe, Michael, is there enough there maybe to go off and speak to the department and say, if we did ask for a review, would it be done in such a way that the review wouldn't impact the current processes and only then if there was agreed outcomes at the end of a review that would be sort of facilitated across to the process to improve it, but that it wouldn't actually stop any of the current processes. Would that be something, Michael, that we would be able to ask for, do you think? Yes, I think so. We can always ask, Chair, so so I can do that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Chair. Yeah. Sorry, Chair. Chair, I mean, you might even find another word, you know, an examination mm -hmm. of the process the post here. <laughs> We might have particular connotations, but an examination of it because we want to do it is to perfect it. Yeah. Um, we do anything that's going to delay it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, look. I tell you what. If, if it's if it's down to ways of words and potential impacts, we can we can check those out. And, and you know, if we're going to lay a committee motion, we want it to be as perfect as possible because then we know when it goes in, it will get the full support. So that's important to do. So we we could do that and bring something back for next week then. Okay. Okay, everybody else ha happy enough there? We can move on then to correspondence. Um, item eight, members, there are nine members of correspondence in the pack. A couple that I just need to bring to people's attention. Um, item 8.4, uh, page 154, uh, from the Committee of Agriculture, Environment, Rural Affairs, is looking for evidence on the climate change bill. Um, although that committee has responsibility for the bill, there are significant elements that are the responsibility of the executive office. Um, what I was going to suggest is that we hear some evidence from the department officials on aspects of the bill that are the responsibility of TEO. And in speaking to the clerk just before um, this meeting, I've suggested that we pull together in tabular form the various clauses that are impacted by TEO, what those impacts would be, and then we can discuss those with the department officials, but we'll also see if there's anybody else that we needed to call in for that. So we'll get that populated, hopefully, for uh, at some point going forward. W would members be happy enough with that? Okay. Um, on item 8.9 on page 167, there is correspondence from an individual requesting engagement with the Committee on the Issue of the Mother and Baby Home, Magdalene Laundries. Um, there's just... There's one little issue in it that we've just noticed, which is that it switches, it's from an individual, but it uses terminology like we and are, and uh, you know, suggesting that it might be more than one person. So I was going to suggest that in the first instance, maybe the clerk would go off and have a word with the person just to see are they representing a group or is there some uh, wider issues? And certainly I know that in the correspondence it referred to the fact that there's no inclusion in the co-design. I thought that maybe we could write to the department, just ask them about the co-design process, how that's going, how many people are contacted to see, just to maybe satisfy ourselves that if somebody out there is saying, they aren't being included in co-design that we can ask the department are people being included and maybe it's just about connecting people rather than than letting something lie would members be happy enough with that great chair okay. yeah chair i think yeah. in the letter it makes reference to an amount of time before they could get a meeting with um to ministers now i know on our side there's been no opposition to that so um yeah. it's worth just even even putting that in writing to you or something just to get clarity on that. 
Sure. Okay, perfect. Um, right, then item nine, forward work programme on the 12th of May, there was a suggestion for the Rock to see you at first committee that the two committees meet on a quarterly basis. Um, we just need to take a formal decision on that, that members will be happy with that to um, continue, uh, or sorry, for that to commence. Uh, would there be agreement for that? Yeah. Take agreement. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So, hi, you, you, you went past the two issues I wanted to raise, I should have said, around correspondence. I just think for ourselves, uh, to extrapolate the information, the Department of Finance has expressed disappointment that the EU replacement funding cuts uh, and the loss of power over funding. I think that's a very um, that that information is something we should make sure we capture because they also outlined about the 70 million funding gap due to the Brexit and the loss of EU funding to the executive. So it was just in the back of the conversations that we had with the two ministers earlier and just drawn that to members' attention. And I think that's something that we should just keep on file and just have access to. Okay, thank you for that. Um, then just uh, in terms of the Brexit issues, as also there has been engagement by the chair, myself with the Northern Ireland chair of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee and the Lord Subcommittee on the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, where they meet with chairs of various assembly committees. Um, I think there, there was an inter-parliamentary forum uh, which had to stand down due to COVID, which is now going to be uh, hopefully revived again. And it involves chairs of relevant committees from all of the different devolved nations and different parliaments to give an opportunity uh, to be able to, to meet up and discuss the various issues that there are. But just get an agreement then that we uh, the clerk can engage with the clerk of the Joint Directors Committee to get some dates scheduled in. There's agreement okay for that. And then on page 170 of the forward work program to page 175 uh, is the um, proposed outline evidence sessions from the arms length bodies. Um, are members happy enough for those to be scheduled? And that really take us up to about the middle of October or so, uh, just to get various information from people there. Members happy enough? Right. Okay. Uh, any other business then is item 10. Anybody, any other business? Trevor? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just, I just wanted to congratulate Martina whenever she uh, used the line, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. I'm sure she realised she was quoting Joni Mitchell from 1970, Big Yellow Taxi. I doubt if she remembers it, but probably somebody's told her about it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. <like> <laughs> I would be very impressed if Martina could remember back that far. It wouldn't be possible. So uh, I am sure she'll appreciate getting that update from you, Trevor. <laughs> I know they didn't say that you didn't remember it, so I have to be very careful here and move on quickly. Um, okay, folks, that brings us to date, time and place of next meeting. So we're back by um, Starleaf again next Wednesday at 2 o'clock. Thank you very much for your attendance and participation today. Thank you. Wish you all the best. Thank Goodbye. You. I get it. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.